Let us stand for the Pledge of Allegiance of the flag. Madam Clerk, you call the roll. Yes, Mr. Bryant. Present. Ms. Bryson Morsberger. Here. Ms. Dooley. Here. Dr. Kraft. Present. Ms. McKeever. Here. Mr. Morris. Yes. Ms. Torres. Yes. And our student rep, Ms. Wong. Present. Thank you. I need a motion to adopt the consent agenda. Um, I so move. Second. It's a proposed agenda. The proposed agenda. Yes, we have a second. Okay. Yes, second. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? Motion passed. Next on agenda is disclosure. Okay, I, Emily Dooley, declare that I have a personal interest in a transaction of the Charlottesville City Public Schools for the reasons set forth below, but I believe I may participate in the deliberations and voting on the transaction as permitted by Virginia Code Sections 2.2-3112B1 and 2.2-3115H. Specifically, one, the transaction in which I intend to participate is deliberation regarding and vote on the Charlottesville City School Board's operating budget for the 23-24 fiscal year, which includes pay to my spouse. Two, my personal interest in the transaction stems from my husband's employment by the Charlottesville City School Board as a social science teacher at Buford Middle School. Three, by way of my association with my husband, I am a member of a group of three or more, all employees of the school board, the members of which are affected by the budget deliberations and approval. And four, I am able to participate in the budget deliberations and vote fairly, objectively, and in the public interest. It is my intention to orally disclose the existence of this interest during each meeting of the Charlottesville City School Board at which the 2023-24 operating budget is discussed and ask that each such disclosure be recorded in the respective meeting minutes. This disclosure will be reflected in the public record of the clerk of the school board for five years. The next item on the agenda are comments from members of the community. So the Charlotte City School Board welcomes comments from members of the community. Speakers are encouraged to keep their comments to three minutes. So if you're in the audience, I'll start with you first. Um, when you get to the podium, please state your name and address. If any of you in the audience would like to speak. I'm gonna to get to that, yeah. So if no one in, in the audience would like to speak, is there someone currently in the Zoom room? No one, okay. Mr. Connor, would you like to come forth and speak? Yes. I feel very hopeful today about what we can accomplish in the collective bargaining process that we're about to begin. I hope that over the next several weeks, through rich discussions in our school buildings, we teachers can decide on the two bargaining topics that we feel will have the greatest impact on improving our students' learning conditions and build democracy in our schools. I think that just as important as what we bargain for, though, will be how we bargain. The contract negotiations that will begin in the coming months should be open to all teachers and staff members, and to the public at large. We are public employees, you are public servants. The public should know what our bargaining priorities are, what stances we take, and what lines we draw. Only then can the public understand the compromises each side will have to make to achieve success, a fair and funded contract. The process by which the collective bargaining resolution that will be passed tonight was negotiated 
could have been a preview of an opening bar open bargaining process. Instead, teachers and staff were left in the dark about negotiations for month months at a time, while a small number of people negotiated behind closed doors with no regular reporting about the status of the process. This dramatically decreased teachers' engagement and resulted in a missed chance to educate staff and the public about how collective bargaining will work in our division. On a personal level, I'm sad to say that the closed process led to my former organizing committee co-chair disengaging entirely from organizing work as she felt that she was unfairly scapegoated for an early breakdown in negotiations, while in her view, she was vigorously representing the interests of her colleagues. What actually took place in that session cannot be verified because it happened behind closed doors. Open negotiations are not yet the norm in collective bargaining, but there's a growing movement to make them so, especially in the public sector. Just in the education context, open bargaining has been employed in Chicago, Concord and Brookline, Massachusetts, St. Paul, Minnesota, and other localities. In Colorado, all public sector bargaining is now open to the public after a ballot initiative was passed by a 70% majority of the state's electorate. The president of the Colorado Education Association explained that we want to be open and transparent with the community and the public. The president of the Concord Teachers Association said, added, being a witness at the table is completely different from getting a report afterwards. Members who witness the process themselves feel more informed and they get fired up. Open bargaining can take various forms, but a typical arrangement would allow for a designated number of in-person attendees from among school system staff and from the general public. In addition, there should be a live stream available so that anyone who is not able to attend in person can nevertheless be witness to the proceedings. I believe an arrangement like this could work extremely well in Charlottesville. As a wise woman once said, transparency builds trust. As we enter this new world of collective bargaining together, let's do this the right way out in the open for everyone to see. Thank you, Allison. Good evening, school board members and Dr. Gurley. I'm Allison Duggar, a senior at Charlottesville High School. In my four years here, never has there been as many acts of student violence during the school year as this year. At first thought, it is easy to push the blame on administration, but the truth is it is not their fault. Even if there is someone or something to blame, why is that the focus? Why do we not focus on making the change that needs to happen? I come to school every day trying my best to forget about the violence that has happened at my school, and I know I'm not the only one who feels this way. While it would be easy for me to point my finger and say that it's the student's fault for the violence, I know it is not. It is the system that has failed them. Instead of having a system that will help prevent violence, we have a system that reacts to violence. When students act out violently, it is not necessarily them just being immature. In fact, it is so much deeper than that. Violent teens are a cry for help. And as a school system, the place where children spend the majority of their developing years, it is your responsibility to answer these calls for help. But how do you do that? We must start at the root cause, mental health. There are a number of reasons a student could be suffering from mental illness, from home life, peers, or simply just the lack of mental health resources, to name a few. It is important to be able to recognize the sign of a student struggling before it gets to the point of them acting out violently. Having a combination of more administrative figures and mental health professionals in the building, I believe can help a student struggling with mental illness be caught quicker. Because when a student creates a bond with a faculty member in the building, they are le less likely to get themselves in trouble because they feel as though there is an adult in the building that they can talk to when they're struggling or having issues. I've seen admins, CSAs, and counselors all make these types of bonds with students and how it positively affects that student. We just don't have enough adults in the building to be able to reach all the students. While there are many more topics that I could speak to you on, unfortunately, I am limited to three minutes. In all honesty, while I believe student violence is a serious issue here at CHS, the main reason I'm here is to get your attention. There are so many reasons why students do not feel safe coming to school. And while I cannot speak for the whole student body, I know that many students feel that admin and school board are not making it a priority to make us be and feel safer at school. It is time to start the conversation with students because those are the people you are here to serve. Come to the schools and talk to students from all social circles. See what it is like through a student's perspective. While I understand that it might be a lot to ask, I do have another proposal. Like you have this monthly meeting open to the public, 
I suggest having a monthly forum open to students during black night time here at CHS. School board could come and talk to groups of students on issues they feel passionate about because not every student can make it to these school board meetings. In fact, not every student knows about these meetings or how they work. It is time for the students to be brought into the conversation about their education. It is time for change. Thank you. Thank you, Allison. Derek Hartline. Good evening, board members, chairman, and superintendent Gurley. My name is Derek Hartline. I'm a community member, lifelong Johnson Village resident, an at-large Johnson Village board member, a Johnson School graduate, Buford graduate, CHS graduate of 1989, also a former Johnson School teacher. The reason why I'm here tonight is to talk about the name changes of the school. I wanna give my thoughts and concerns on specifically renaming Johnson. Looking at the participant survey that was given out to the public, the people that were taking the, um, the survey couldn't just select to keep the same name, making the results val unvalid. Did the survey reach a meaningful population was one of the suggestions that I had taken on. What percent were from Charlottesville as there was only 272 participants and was a survey the best option for such a controversial issue? How thorough was the research that was done? What information came directly from Dr. Johnson's family? Many of the results I saw came from local Wikipedia and the research was compiled by a committee member, not a non-biased party. I had to ask myself, why was Dr. Johnson's father referenced in the information. As educators, we don't judge students by their parents' actions, so why are we doing that here? The vote for Johnson was very close. It was less clear with a five to three margin. More information is needed. I took it upon myself to create an old-fashioned petition to see what city residents around where I live a voting age thought. And I ended up with over 100 signatures that just said, keep Johnson the same which is more than the, the number that said that it needs to be changed. I know I'm just one person collecting the data, but if one person could do this, okay, what can more people do? I'll be giving this information to the clerk. I was on the Zoom call in January and there was only 34 participants. All the suggestions except for one was to retain the name Johnson School. Two parents of Berlin Moran said that they really wanted to see the BME initials kept it was a very interesting coincidence that a BME option existed when Venable, Clark, and Johnson didn't have this option to retain their initials. One committee member who also is a Burley Moran administrator was on this committee. I had to ask myself, is this leading? Was the choice to have Blue Mountain Elementary done impartially? Blue Mountain is in Pennsylvania, where Blue Ridge Mountain is in Virginia and a region for identification in the fourth grade SOLs that we submit. More third and fourth, fourth graders wrote in Johnson to retain the name. This is more than any other choice. Why didn't the staff have a write-in option on their ballot? Since we have no control in the era we live in, how is it that we can judge Johnson for the era he lived in? Now that it's March and we're kicking off Women's History Month, together, Burley and Moran had 98 years in the division. We should honor their names and not cast them away. This year, we were given this shirt that has all the names on it. And on the back, it says better together. When the names were together, they were better. But now we're just separating them and turning this into a relic. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Hartline. Is there anyone else in the audience who would like to speak at this time? Mr. Como, do we have anyone in the Zoom room? Um, there's no one with their hand raised, but I will give the final call. If you're in the attendee gallery and you'd like to speak uh, publicly, please raise your hand at this time using the raise hand tool so we can promote you to speaking world. Thank you all for those of you all who came up to speak. 
Our next item on the agenda is the adoption of the consent agenda. Do I have a motion? Any discussion? Second, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion passed. Next item on the agenda is the approval of the collective bargaining agreement, Dr. Gurley. Good, e good evening. Good evening, Mr. Bryant, members of the school board and those assembled in the audience. It gives me great pleasure to stand before you this evening to make the request that you approve the collective bargaining resolution. As you know, the school board, teachers, uh, central office staff, and, and education association has worked tirelessly to craft a document that is reflective of the values and needs of the proposed bargaining units. Uh, before I ask for your recommendation, I would, like to, I would like to make you aware that the CEA has asked that the committee review two sections of the resolution. Section 4A2 regarding the authorization cards and section 7B number four representation of the bargaining unit. Um, in an effort to not delay the action of accepting the resolution tonight, I ask that you accept the resolution as presented. Additionally, the collective bargaining committee uh, will, uh, will re um, I'm sorry. Additionally, the collective bargaining committee will reconvene to discuss the two proposed um, sections. If minimal um, modifications are made, I ask that you allow me to add the revision to the consent agenda for your future approval. Uh, so at this point, are there any questions um, about anything that I just stated? If, questions. if there are no questions, um, then we do, need a, um, we do need a motion to approve the resolution as presented and the committee will reconvene to address the two sections proposed by CEA and those minimal revisions will be added to the consent agenda at a later time. Do I have a motion? Yes, um, I would like to move that we, um, Charlottesville City School Board, accept the collective bargaining resolution as stated. Is there a second? Second. Discussion? Any questions? I just have some discussion. Do we, yeah. Um, okay, so I just wanted to say thank you so much for your evolution on this topic. It's been so helpful and your guidance has been really helpful for me personally. So thank you for that. Um, I, I find it interesting the way things are always changing in terms of the goalposts here. So I am fascinated by that. Um, I think we need thoughtful negotiation with the CEA and um, fired up is not how I would describe any of the negotiations that I would wanna see in the future. I think we need deliberate, thoughtful negotiation. Um, and that does involve incredibly honest, difficult conversations that should not be necessarily open to the public um, just to retain the trust amongst the people in the room. Um, so I appreciate and I've always championed uh, collective bargaining. I, I do always want to be on the front edge of this and I uh, appreciate this board and it's also evolution on um, in this arena. Um, I do want to say that this is incredibly challenging and it will continue to be. And I know that you have been so gracious in your willingness to um, take it on. And I just hope that that what um, Mr. Koenig asked here today was for just trans, trans, um, transparency, but also communication. And I wanna say that um, I feel like our side, if there was a side in this negotiation, um, attempted every effort 
to be communicative with our um, amongst ourselves and with the public. And I just think if there are, um, there needs to be rep, um, what do I wanna say? Understanding that both sides need to communicate with their members and their constituents. And it's not solely on uh, the superintendent side to make sure that teachers all are all aware of what's happening in the room. Like that is just not a way to get things done. You need to communicate. You're gonna be a bargaining unit that is very important. The communication needs to start um, on, uh, in your leadership. So I really hope and appreciate Dr. Uh, Mr. Koenig for bringing that up today, um, because that is something that we as a board feel really passionate about. Well, I don't wanna speak for anybody else, but I feel passionate that communication is the key and the communication really needs to come from all of the teachers and all of the staff in the buildings. Um, so thank you. I look forward to voting for this. And I know it's been a long road and thanks for your patience. Thank you. Ms. Dooley, Mr. Morris. I'll just keep my comments pretty short. Um, you know, thinking about this as this was coming towards us and uh, specifically after last meeting, um, I just kind of appreciate being in this country and having the opportunity to have our first amendment right and being able to speak as individuals. And this also that that First Amendment right and being able to speak um, is, you know, what lends its hand to teachers being able to to advocate for themselves as well. Without saying the entire speech that I, that I had uh, in mind, um, what I would like to highlight is Miss Allison um, in, in regards to the student voice. Um, the collective bargaining agreement gives teachers the opportunity that to enhance their voice, but ultimately what we wanna do is make sure that our students know that they're being heard, their voice um, is being heard, that we engage with them, as well as ensuring, um, ensuring that their success is at the end of this collective bargaining agreement, that we know that they are our main customers, if you will. We want our students to be successful. So Ms. Allison, thank you for your words. Ms. Wang, Ms. Torres. Um, yes, thank you. So again, I do wanna thank you, Dr. Gurley. I mean, I reflect back and I know probably many of the teachers can reflect back to when Dr. Gurley stood at the podium with Ms. Taylor. Um, when we first brought this forward as a topic to consider. So um, we've come a long way and, and we have had a lot, of, a lot of meetings, a lot of hours and a lot of discussion, as Mr. Moore said, ultimately, um, you know, for the good of the students. I mean, that, that's what we're all here for, um, all of us together. So I look forward to this. I, I think we all have agreed that there's still a lot of pieces to this that are unknown. Um, because we haven't got beyond this point before. So I know that we will be diligent and continue to work well together in figuring out those pieces. Um, in all honesty, some of my concerns throughout this um, process um, were that I think we have a champion of, of communication and somebody who wants to hear from teachers and staff about what's going on and um, I don't have the answer to what collective bargaining will do to that process. I mean, it will change that a little bit as far as um, how and when grievances are filed. So that, that remains to be determined and, and we all trust that we will um, continue to um, represent and support each other the best that we can throughout this. As, as again, like I said, there are a lot of unknowns. Also, uh, you know, conversations that we as a board had was wanting to make sure that whatever um, um, exclusive representative is chosen and voted to to represent the teachers truly represents and equitably represents all of the teachers. Um, and, and, you know, reflecting back to who shows up to speak in favor of collective bargaining, it was really important to us to wanna make sure that that each teacher um, you know, has the ability and, and equitable access to um, voice their concerns. And then when, thing, when things are brought to 
um, the superintendent or his team throughout this process that, that everybody's voice remains heard. Um, this is this is historical and, and it's been a journey and I'm, I'm really pleased to, to be a part of it and here tonight. So thank you. And Dr. Kraft. Well, um, I'm happy that we have reached this moment. And um, yes, there are a lot of unknowns and a lot of, you know, there'll be a lot of wrinkles and complexities as there always are. Um, but I would like to just uh, say, I, I really appreciate uh, all of the effort and the passion that has gone into this process. And I, I mainly just want to celebrate the moment here. Uh, you know, this is, this is really um, a big moment for our Charlottesville City Schools community. And um, I'm really happy to be here and happy to uh, celebrate what we've, the work that we've done together and knowing that, that we will be continuing to work together as one community. Ms. Morsenberger. I just wanted to echo some of the things that um, my colleagues have said. Um, thank you, Dr. Gurley, um, for going on this journey with us. And um, for all the teachers, thank you guys for being patient um, while we worked through the process and we all got here. Um, and so, yeah, this is a, a good night. And I just want to kind of echo um, part of what well, not what Ms. McKeever was saying, but the idea that we're here in collective bargaining going forward, we are gonna have several more meetings and tough conversations and that things get uncomfortable. And I think that everyone wants to get to the same place. So just, I hope we all keep that in mind as we move forward to the process that there will be disagreements and discord and that's bargaining and how it works, but I'm sure that we'll all get to where we need to be. And, um, since we are um, one of the few boards in the state that um, will be a, have a collective bargaining unit, I would also like to see us move forward on some ideas to get more student voice involved because I do, um, I would like to hear more from students and their perspective and ideas and how they'd like to see um, the school community and the board, you know, how we can help them and what they'd like to see us do. So. Um, that's it, thank you. Dr. Gurley, I uh, certainly wanna thank you for being open and leading the charge. Um, this is a great day for our teachers and our students. And I wanna again, thank um, Ms. Torres and Ms. Dooley and the CEA members for, their, for all of the long meetings and, and um, the negotiations back and forth has led us to this moment. So it is a great day um, for the Charlottesville City Schools. And yes, moving forward, there are a lot of unknowns, but I'm sure we will rise to the occasion and figure it out. So congratulations. And thank you again, Ms. Dooley, Ms. Torres, for your hard work and the CA members who are part of this negotiating team. So are there, if there, are there any other comments? If not, um, Madam Clerk, I would like to do a roll call of the vote. Okay. Mr. Bryant? Yes. Ms. Bryson Morsberger? Yes. Ms. Dooley? Yes. Dr. Kraft? Yes. Ms. McKeever? Yes. Mr. Morris? Yes. Ms. Torres? Yes. Motion passed. Congratulations. All right, but the next item on our agenda is um, school naming and um, Dr. Baptist will come forth. Chairman Bryant, members of the board, Dr. Gurley. Um, I'm here tonight to share with you the uh, process that the mem members of the Naming of Facilities Committee have had since January 
and with recommendation at the end of the presentation. You can go to the next slide, please. So in January and in part of February, we did have a survey for both Burnley Moran and Johnson, which was on our, our website. I'll mention more about that in a second. We also had a community forum on January the 26th. Mm -hmm. We had student voting at both schools, grades three and four on January the 30th, a committee meeting on January 31st. We had staff voting at both schools on February the 9th, and then a committee meeting on February the 21st. And so we're here this evening with the results of those meetings. So I, what I will do is talk about Burnley Moran first and then talk about Johnson. So some of the data that we used for, for the Burnley Moran uh, discussion was a survey that was mentioned, the student vote, and then the staff vote. One of the questions on the community survey, which was answered by 396 people, was the question that's listed here. Do you believe that Burnley Moran should today be named for Carrie Burnley and uh, I've already mispronounced it, Zarepta Moran. And when we looked at the numbers, it, uh, you can see that if someone rated it a one, they strongly believed it should continue. And if they rated it a five, they strongly believed it should uh, be changed. When we sort of looked at the ones and twos versus the fours and fives, we had about 22.8% or 23% who thought it should be the same, and um, a little over 61% who felt that it should be changed. So that was one of the data points that we looked at and the committee determined that we should look at a, a name change. And so then we started looking at different names to, to consider. Um, next slide, please. And also on the survey, we did have some names that we discussed just to give con uh, conversation starters. Some of the ones that we looked at were ones that are listed here. And these were the names that the committee chose to take to the students in grades three and four, uh, Blue Ridge or Blue Mountain Elementary, which would maintain the BME, which was uh, something that many of the people at Burnley Moran were interested in doing. Plus we had Blue Ridge Mountain Elementary. We had Ravana Elementary, and you can see the vote totals for each of those. We did have seven students who chose not to vote. And then we had 29 write-ins. And really the only one that, that got more than one vote for write-in was either Burnley Moran again or stay the same with 21 votes. So it was pretty decidedly that if we had a name change that we would go with Blue Mountain Elementary. The committee met again and decided to ask the staff what they felt. And so um, February the 9th, we had a, a survey that went out to the staff 42 voted on that, and you can see that what the vote totals were, Blue Mountain 33, Ravana 7, and two chose not to vote. So that is when we um, decided as a committee to bring forth as a recommendation, Blue Mountain Elementary for Burnley Moran. That is the end of the information about Burnley Moran at this point. Um, I'd ask if you want to talk about that, if you want me to go to Johnson and then come back for discussion. Does anyone have any questions? This point. Any questions? We move on. Okay, um, we can go into the next slide, please. So for Johnson, we had very similar information: the survey, the student vote, and the staff vote. Next slide, please. Had the same question on the survey asking if you believe that Johnson should uh, today be named for Dr. James G. Johnson. If the rating was one, it was a strongly believed yes. If the rating was five, it was strongly believed no. Uh, the information was a little closer here for the ones and twos, which would be strongly believed yes, and then believe yes. It was approximately 30%, a little over 30%. For the those for the per persons who said either four or five that they believed or strongly believed that it should be changed, it was 49.6. So right about 50% felt that the name should be changed. So again, we had been looking at some possible names as not just placeholders, but the discussion starters. And from there, we uh, the committee whittled down the names to three names that we took to the vote for the students. Cherry Avenue Elementary, Forest Hills Elementary, Landmark Elementary. 
again, had write-ins. We didn't have any abstentions from the third and fourth graders at Johnson, but we did have 46 write-ins, and only uh, one got more than one vote, and that was Johnson, or either to keep it the same with, with 29. The committee met again, and it was decided that we would ask the staff the opinion and did a vote with them. Uh, rather than taking three names, it was decided that two names would go, and the two names that were decided were Cherry Avenue and Forest Hills. So the staff voted. Next slide, please. Had 36 staff members from Johnson to vote, and uh, the breakdown here, 23 for Cherry Avenue and 13 for Forest Hills. And no abstentions. So... Um, going to this. So as a result, the committee met again, uh, I think it was the 21st of February, and talked about all of the information that we had received. And in addition, we had received some correspondence from um, community members and family members, which you have also received. And in following the, um, all of the information that we had, the recommendation from the committee has been to rename Burnley Moran Elementary as Blue Mountain Elementary School and to rename Johnson Elementary as Cherry Avenue Elementary. So I bring this information to you as a recommendation from the Naming of Facilities Committee, not requesting any sort of action this evening, but to bring for uh, discussion and I'll attempt to answer any questions you might have and then would uh, see if you have any direction or we would come back in April for a possible vote. Mr. Keever, do you have any questions? I'll start in your direction. Mr. Morris. Actually, can you come back to me, please? Ms. Morrisonberg? No. Dr. Not Craig. at this time. Dr. Craig? Okay. Ms. Torres? Ms. Wong? Okay. Mr. Morris? I guess it's back up to me. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I apologize for not uh, sending this out earlier. Um, do you happen to know like where Cherry Avenue came from? I feel a little bit weird about naming a, a school. Like, is it just Cherry Blossoms? Is it, is that a name as well? I don't know the origin. Someone from, who is a native. No, I'm sorry, let me, street name. let me clarify my question. Do we happen to know the origins of the street street name? I, I don't know that. I know that Cherry Avenue is because the school's on Cherry Avenue, but I don't know the origin of how it became Cherry Avenue. Someone else may have that information. Okay. I don't. I can, I'll be glad to see if I can find it out, okay. but I don't know that. Yeah, and sorry for not sending that ahead. Um, Ms. McKeever, you have a comment? Well, she has a question, and I'll get to your comment. Oh, go ahead. And was, Beth Chuck has some. Mm -hmm. Oh, go ahead, uh, Mr. Morris. I, I, there is a uh, a very helpful directory of street names and their origins on the internet. And for Cherry Avenue, it simply says botanical name, so it's named for the cherry. All right, thank you. As I far appreciate as, that. As far as the person who listed that was able to determine it. Anyway. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Beth Chuck knows everything. Ms. Mor Ms. Morrisonberg. <laughs> um, we've gotten a lot of emails, and we've had lively debates about these subjects. And I guess I would be remiss if I didn't address it. And so I guess, because a lot of the letters, they talk about changing the name and erasing history. And, you know, just as a, a board member and a parent, you know, when we talk about leaving the names the same, it, it's, I don't know, just as like, am I always supposed to tell my kid things are named after people with an asterisk? Like it's named after this person and they were principal or they were superintendent. You couldn't go to the school during that time period, but they were the first, you know, female principal or they were, I don't know, it's just really hard for to talk about these names without being honest about the things like you could, I, I think I'm an awesome person. I don't think you should name anything after me because everyone has a blind spot. People are just problematic in general. Um, and hindsight's always 2020, but just, I just felt the need to say like, 
these people can be amazing people to you and in your family and they can be great, but in the educational setting, do we just tell the kids to go to these schools? We're honoring the people with their names on the building. You would not have been welcome in this building, but we're, when they were here, but we're still honoring them. And so I think that those are important conversations too. And I don't think that your name not being on a building erases history. The history is still there. Um, it's the, the person was still a person. They still did all the things they did. It's just naming things after almost just most people is problematic in general and kind of have to address these things, especially in education, because kids ask questions, they're curious, they want to know. And so I, I don't know, like it, it seems problematic to me that it, there's always an asterisk. I think it's better to just have a nice clean name that's not about a person that we have to explain away some part of their history or de-emphasize membership in the Daughters of the Confederacy and try to explain, like just have a clean slate, whatever it it's going to be Cherry or Blue Ridge or Blue Mountain, but just, I felt like in Charlottesville, like this is part of the conversations we need to have is that a lot of these places are named after problematic, you know, people who have some problematic things in their history and no one really wants to address those. When we have the discussion, that's just an afterthought. And for me, it's not an afterthought when I have to explain it uh, to a little kid that wants to know why, you know, why it was this way or why they couldn't go to a school. The committee had very in-depth discussions about this topic and not to say that there's anything wrong with any of the people for whom the buildings have been named, but looking at our current values and trying to look at the names of schools having purpose in place more so than names. Um, even in media inquiries, we've made the comment that we're not to say that any of the three people that we're talking about for this decision are bad people at all, just looking at getting away from names for reasons that you've said. Um, and we've talked about in the committee that one of the uh, recommendations to the school board would be a revision in the naming of facilities policy to look at moving away from that. That's not been done yet, but we feel like you know, we don't want to do something that then will be a problem down the road, but looking at purpose in place or more where the committee has tried to land. Okay, Ms. McKeever. Um, so the Blue Mountain is in Pennsylvania. That is my concern about Blue Mountain. Tell me more about what- Blue Mountain will keep the BME initials, which the school was very interested in, in doing that. Okay, but I I hear that, uh, but I'm sure if other schools had had that option, they might have brought that up as well. Did anybody from Johnson suggest that? No. Okay. Or Clark or Venables? No. Okay. Um, okay, thanks, that's all. Dr. Crabb. Well, I guess I would I would just say that um, I, I guess a couple of things. Yeah, one there's there's a Blue Mountain. I, I don't think there was a desire to, you know, pick a particular um, mountain in the country, but just um, you know that is a name. There's a brewery named Blue Mountain as well. So and there's probably a lot of other things that are named Blue Mountain in different parts of the country, and this is just uh, the name. Uh, I don't think it's intended to uh, reference a place in Pennsylvania or anywhere else, but just uh, it's a nice name that, and that was the preference uh, for the people in the Burnley Moran community. Um, I do just want to uh, echo um, the the thought that um, you know about naming after people, and you know I, you know I I can see where if you were. If you are a family member or descendant of some of these people, um, you know that you might feel that they're being disparaged, and that is definitely not uh, our intention to, to do that at all. And so, um, you know, I think we've realized as we've gone through this process, um, you know, that 
just the idea of um, continuing naming after after people is just not a not a good idea moving forward. And so, and we want to do this in a way that does not disparage anybody, um, because we don't know all the we don't know all the history of of you know these people's lives or what their thoughts were. We just don't have all the information. Um, and you know, but I think just in general um, to say that this is sort of the way, the direction that we're heading um, is, is to move away from naming after people. And it's not intended to um, disparage uh, or reduce accomplishments of, of any particular people. Thank you, Dr. Clay. So are there any other comments or questions at this time? Well, oh, thank you, Dr. Babs. Thank you. Next on the agenda is Amanda Corman, strategic plan update. Good evening, everybody. Thanks, Leslie. Good evening, everybody. Thanks for having me this evening. So this is going to be a relatively short update about where we are in our strategic plan development. Um, so we, like we talked about last time, we have a, an ambitious plan for having a strategic plan, a next five-year strategic, strategic plan in place by August of 2023. And so here we are a month later, and we are still in the significant stakeholder engagement phase. So I just wanted to remind everybody, oops. Oh, okay. <laughs> I just wanted to, remind, wanted to remind everybody what our stakeholder engagement plan looks like for here. So we have, we, um, are, have formed a steering committee, which is a cross section of our stakeholders, both staff, parents, uh, leadership and community partners who are meeting monthly to elevate key ideas and to um, bring information to the, to the executive leadership team. Um, but obviously the uh, a really important piece is our engagement with our community. And that's mostly what I'm gonna be reviewing tonight is our community survey, which closed on February 27th. So we don't have results from the community survey, but I just wanted to tell you about how, um, how it did. And then obviously we'll be coming to you as a school board to give you monthly updates but uh, also review the dates that the school board is engaging more directly with the planning process too. So our community survey, yes, I'm missing the top. I think that just says community survey overview. So the community survey was a big picture and we told folks it would only take five minutes to complete. So was, the idea was we wanted to make it accessible. Um, it was really asking about high level priorities for the division. Just to tell you a little bit about how we got the survey out into the community it was an English version and a Spanish version. And through our um, Google suite, it's also translatable into the other languages that are in our division. We opened it February 15th and it closed February 27th. Uh, we sent out two mass communications to all staff and families to launch it and to remind folks about it. We posted about it on social media. Uh, we posted about it on Canvas, which is the program that, um, that students can access, and we did some outreach for student input at Walker, Buford, and CHS, and I'm particularly happy to see how much our students at CHS engaged with this survey. And we also did press release, and we had some media coverage, so we're appreciative of that, and these are some of the communications for those who saw them. So what happened. We had 1,173 total responses. Wow. <laughs> this is my spirited GIF mm -hmm. because I am, I am really excited and grateful to the community uh, for taking the time to engage with this. So 1,173 people doing a five-minute survey, that's about 100 hours of community input just through this survey. So very excited about that. Again, as I said, um, we don't have the, we don't have the data put together tonight. That is 
going to be what our consulting group insight has data analysts that will be able to give us a really in-depth um, read of what the community said, but I just wanted to tell you about who we heard from. So this is a quick chart. So we heard from just under half of the respondents were parents, but we also heard from about a quarter of the respondents were our students. And again, most of those were CHS students. So we saw a lot of engagement from our Black Knights and I'm really appreciating that. And their voices are so important since so many of them have had, have, have, have had their whole education in our school system. We also heard from 217 employees and then 72 folks who are both parents in our system as well as staff. And then additionally, and importantly, 57 community members. And then we also asked uh, what schools and programs people are affiliated with most. So it looks like Charlottesville High School is, is um, the most well represented, but in fact, if you actually, you know, that Charlottesville is double the size of Buford and Walker. So, and then Buford and Walker, you know, kind of collect in from the elementary school. So it's actually fairly, um, fairly well spread across all of our programs. And we did hear from all of our programs. So we heard from LMA, Hospital Ed, Learning Center, Central Office, and KTEC as well. So again, this is going to be a, a stay tuned uh, to be continued because we don't have the responses, but I am excited to see that, um, that we have had such rich engagement. And this isn't the only way we're gonna be working with the community on this. Our steering committee, part of their mandate is to be ambassadors of the strategic, strategic planning process and to be holding focus groups with their different, uh, with different people in their in their communities, right? So make, we are absolutely and definitely going to have focus groups with different groups of students um, who are not on the steering committee because we we're just concerned that the schedule that we keep was not consistent with, we just felt we couldn't ask that of our students, but we're gonna make sure we're hearing from them in different focus groups, but also, oh, sorry, also focus groups gonna be in a lot of different neighborhoods, different community partners. Um, so this is the work of a steering committee that's about 35 people strong is gonna be able to hear again from another broad swath of the community in a more in-depth way than, than a survey may. So the what's next piece is that our consultant will be doing a data analysis. We will continue getting feedback and the steering committee and the executive leadership committee are going to start drafting priorities. And actually at next month's meeting, I expect to be sharing some of those with the school board. And then just a reminder for the school board about the meetings that we have planned for a more in-depth engagement with you. And that's it. And I'll be happy to take questions. I'll start on the same. Ms. Wong, do you have any questions? Um, thank you for your presentation. I had one kind of just aside. Um, so together with the other two uh, school board student reps, um, we actually held, we had a like small scale focus group to kind of just kind of go over uh, some of the items that were on the strategic plan. And um, I think, so these were all students that obviously had a lot to say about the up, uh, policies that have been in place and will be in place. But um, there were a lot of them that just, that had not filled out the survey. And I just want to, I mean, it, I think you're, Kind of touching on the areas where there are going to be gaps in the people who respond but um i just want to call that to attention again that i mean uh that there's a large population at chs and the other schools who def who ha definitely have input to give that not, are not will not be represented on this I appreciate that so much, and I particularly appreciate the effort that you and the other student school rep board reps put in to hold that focus group. And any information that you have with that, you please, please if you ha if somebody took notes or if you had some themes that came out of that, we would absolutely love to see it, and we'd love to work with you in the soon to do to do more of that. So I just really appreciate you. Yeah. Yeah, it would be great to reach out. Awesome. Ms. Torres, Dr. Graff, Ms. Morrison-Burger, Mr. 
Mr. Morris, Mr. Uli. Well, thank you so much, Amanda, for sharing this valuable information. And we look forward to getting to the final results. Us too. Soon, and thank everyone um, that participated in the survey up to this point. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bryant. Thanks, everyone. Next on the agenda is uh, Ms. Kim Powell, Middle School Modernization Project Update. Good evening, Chairman Bryant and members of the board and Dr. Gurley. I'm really excited to be talking about this topic this evening. Um, I'm gonna give it just a minute for the slides to get queued up. It's a brief presentation, but we're very excited about where we are in this process. So, we can go to the next slide, Leslie, or actually I can probably take it from here, right? Yep. So on February the 6th, um, the invitation to bid was out on the street, so to speak. And you can see the other details. These, these processes are always a process. There are multiple steps because it's quite a technical process um, to, for, the, for the bidders to go through to ascertain all the information. They ask questions and all of that good stuff. And the important date is March 14th when the bids will be received. Bid opening will be that afternoon, around two o'clock, I think. Um, so let's go to the next slide. I don't think I can. Yep, thanks. So um, we're very fortunate to have here with us this evening with Knox, who's been our um, BMDO leader through this project. And a really very thoughtful process was done by the steering committee. Many of you were part of that, or you know, two of you. <laughs> it was two by two process. but you know, laying this, being very intentional about laying this process for the project and interlacing it with the budget process that we're in right now. And so um, what this slide does is it shows, you know, where we are in the budget process as we head into March, and then where the March 14th falls in the context of the other dates with the budget. So, um, you know, after the bids are received on March the 14th, soon after that is a community budget forum. Then there's um, a council work session for the CIP. Um, and then there's the first reading of the fiscal year 24 budget. And then uh, approximately one month after those bids are received, it, it is at that point that council's adopting their next budget. Um, I really don't think it could have been planned any better. This reflects a lot of intentional planning. And so a lot of credit to the work BMDO did and all the other folks who were involved in that process. Next slide, okay. So this is a graphic that um, VMDO provided you. So if it looks familiar, it's because you saw it back in the fall and the green box is kind of the we are here <laughs> part of this chart. Um, we're, we're in the bidding part right there in um, 2023. And then you can see where the blue construction box begins. That's June, you know, six months, halfway through 2023, June, this coming June. Uh, construction begins. Now, how long construction will take exactly and how much it will cost, those are the questions we can answer much better in about 12 days. <laughs> so um, it's a very exciting time. And I just also think this chart is a great reflection of a lot of hard work that has been put in by a lot of people, including you all, to get us to this moment, which will truly be a transformational moment for Charlottesville City Schools, for our students and families. So um, this is really, we just felt like this was an important time, um, a little bit of a, I don't wanna say calm before the storm, because this is a, um, the eve of a very happy thing, um, but just a, a, a good time to remind everyone of where we've been and where we are in this very important process. And I'm happy to take questions at this time. And, and Mr. Knox is here as well, if there are questions that he can answer, but we were just talking, we'll know a lot more in about two weeks. <laughs> um, we'll start with you, Ms. McKee, do you have any questions? Stooley? Is there any way, do we have any idea how many bids we expect? Like one, more than one? More than one, more than one. I've been talking with Mr. Goddard at the city about that. And I can tell you that the interest has been good. And that is a very good thing. We're, we're happy to, to say that it was, um, and from folks who we would expect or hope would be interested. Yeah. Mr. Morris, anybody questions on this side? Okay. I'm just curious about, you know, how do you, um, how do you decide on the best bid? Is it just price or is it 
other factors. Oh, I'm gonna, I've only, I don't have as much experience with this as Mr. Knox, so I'd like for him to speak to what it looks like. It is, Bryce, it's open public procurement. Um, there are two criteria um, for all the bidders in addition to price. One is you have to have worked on a school project worth a construction value of $30 million or more over the last five years. You have to have done two of those. And you also have to have experience working on an occupied school site where school's in session. Um, so if, if you've done both those things and you're the lowest bid, you get selected. Do, do you ever solicit um, like recommend re references on the various uh, you know, construction companies? The projects that we ask them to list to prove that they've done those things include uh -huh. references. Okay, thanks. Stories. Um, good to see you both, and and it is exciting to kind of get updates on this. So I appreciate the update and where we're at in the timeline. And as Miss Powell said, I mean, Wick, I was always so impressed with just uh, your intent on on the timeline and and just always being five steps ahead of us with that. So really, really appreciate you and your team and and all of the work. So thank you. Ms. Wong, thank you. Any other questions we can? Oh yeah, you gotta give us the update, Ms. Powell on KTEC. Um, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So again, we'll give it just a moment to get the next um, set of slides up. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we also felt that this evening was a good time to uh, provide the community with an update uh, regarding KTEC. And so uh, the first thing that we wanna do is before we talk about moving ahead, we think it's worthwhile to just take a moment and provide a quick reminder of how we got to this point with the board moving to acquire sole ownership of KTEC. First and foremost, um, we know the board and this community recognize KTEC as an incredibly valuable community resource that um, diversifies learning opportunities for students and adults. It's operated for over 50 years through the partnership between Albemarle County and Charlottesville City Schools. Um, a, a, there was a letter in June of, of 2022, a letter of intent to purchase um, was sent from Albemarle County Public Schools to the Charlottesville City School Board. And that letter did offer slots, but it didn't address um, how the operations would be maintained to ensure access for Charlottesville City School students, short-term or long-term really. So there, was a, a, there were a lot of questions and concerns with that. And so then fast forward to two days before our winter break in December of 2022, just this past December, Albemarle County Public Schools initiated the process under the 1969 partnership agreement to dissolve the partnership and that required a decision by the Charlottesville City School Board within 60 days to either buy or sell at the price set by Albemarle County Public Schools. Um, as a sub note to that, the value established in the offer from Albemarle County Public Schools was more than $1.2 million below the independent valuations that were received by the Charlottesville City School Board. But I will point out that is smaller font sub bullet because truly in all the deliberations of the school board, this was this valuation piece was minor in comparison to um, the concern and the desire to ensure both near term and long term access to the valuable K tech programs for for the area and for Charlottesville City School students. So that's how we got here. Um, next slide, Leslie. Thank you. I don't know why I can't that the arrows aren't working for me this evening. So, um, so here's a timeline of where we are now. Um, again, you see December. Um, this is just the, a timeline view and the star shows where we are now in February of 2023. You know, Albemarle initiated the process, the school board made its decision and we are now embarking on transition discussions and meetings and those have started. Um, looking ahead, um, KTEC does continue to operate under joint governance as the transition work continues through the upcoming school year. And then on July 1st of 2024, KTEC still continues to operate, but it's under the sole ownership of Charlottesville City Schools. Next slide. 
So I also wanna just let everyone know, Dr. Gurley and uh, Dr. Haas, they have been talking quite a bit since the board action. And we've also been in regular communication with Ms. Stephanie Carter, who is the leader of, of KTEC. And in fact, we had our first sit down, starting to do the deep dive type of transition meeting um, earlier this week. Um, and this is just the beginning because of many, many transition meetings that, are, that lie ahead of us because there are many details that need to be addressed. Um, this slide just summarizes the, the major areas of transition that we need to address. In each of these areas, we're forming um, transition teams. So you have accounting and finance. We actually met this morning with the, um, Renee and I were at KTEC this morning working with KTEC staff in this area, uh, human resources and personnel. Um, there's actually all the programming and the partnerships around those programs. There's infrastructure and facilities, which this area is one we already know quite a bit about because in the division of duties and the partnership, the facilities piece and the CIP that was already under our facilities development team with the CIP. Then there's technology. Mr. Cuomo was at our first transition meeting. There's a lot of details to be worked out there. And then there's other miscellaneous matters like notifying VDOE and a host of other little things. Um, we have pages of checklist items that um, Ms. Carter has taken the, the lead and starting to put together. And we're all thinking a lot of the same thoughts about this moving forward and we're excited to do the work. Um, so we'll be working with KTEC staff throughout this transition. Next slide, Leslie, thanks. So the goal for, for Charlottesville City Schools is to work together to ensure continuity of operations and programming for the staff, the adults, the high school students for Charlottesville Album Mall and the surrounding area. The transition team, um, just like you see, you know, the actions that were taken to initiate this, these, this change and you know, put the board in a position to make the decision, that's the drop in the water, right? And all the work we do as a core transition team and all the sub teams, everything we do is with a lens to make sure that the transition is a series of smooth ripples and not big waves. That's the best way I know to describe it. Um, so that's, you know, that's a very popular image up there, but that's the goal. That's what we want to convey to people. That's what we want people to know. And next slide, Leslie. So I, I want to wrap up for all the details that, and there are many of them that we are still working through. I want to kind of end on this note and that's what's in a name. Well, KTEC is a big name in this area. It is a brand that is well-recognized and it has a ton of value. And so we just want to go ahead and put out there that the recommendation, our recommendation is a staff team and a core team is that effective July 1st, 2024, KTEC is still KTEC. It's just the Charlottesville Area Technical Education Center. And KTEC moves on into the future, still providing very, a lot of value and meaningful services for this area. We understand how important KTEC is for our business community, for our students, um, and Charlottesville City School Board's decision that you made, given the choice you had to make, it reflects this commitment and this understanding. And we have a great team that's going to be working through this transition. So um, that's all I have and happy to take questions. I'll start with Ms. McKeever. Do you have any questions or comments? There's a lot of work to be done, um, and we'll certainly be tapping people into the process as we go step by step. Just like that ripple of change goes out in any process of this significance, you start with the core, and then you just it's it's the the people involved and the work to be done. It'll it'll ripple out, and there'll there will need to be regular updates. Um, because there are a lot of stakeholders in this, right? A lot of stakeholders. Okay, Ms. Dooley. Thank you. I just want to take a second to acknowledge um, the anxiety that a lot of stakeholders are feeling, both students, parents, both in the city and in the county, um, PVCC partners, teachers at KTEC, um, you know, the local businesses that benefit from uh, the students who graduate from KTEC. Um, and so just acknowledge that anxiety. Um, and I appreciate your focus on the small ripples as opposed to tidal waves. Um, and that as we're working through this, that we just continue to focus on what our primary goal is, which are the students and providing a really robust technical education uh, programming. Mr. Morris. Second, Ms. Dooley. 
Ms. Morrisonberg. Uh, yeah, third, Ms. Dooley. Um, <laughs> but just also to say um, to the people out there who have anxiety that our initial and our first choice was always to remain operating um, under the agreement that we had. Um, but since we no longer had that choice, we thought that this was a good decision because we would like to keep KTEC as a regional resource and we wanna see the program grow um, and career um, technical education is just, it's really important. And it, I don't think it gets the emphasis that it needs because college is not for every student for a variety of reasons. Um, financial being the biggest one I think these days. Um, but yeah, the, it, k Tech is very important and um, we just wanna see it grow and blossom um, under Charlottesville's um, leadership. Thank you. Dr. Kraft. Yeah, I, I guess I'd also <clears throat> like to acknowledge some of the concerns that I'm hearing um, out in the community and from people who've, um, you know, been in the community a long time. And I think there's a, 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 a lack of understanding and a sense of confusion about why this partnership is dissolving. Um, you know, sort of why is this happening? And um, that's, that's out there. Um, so there's probably a need to um, continue to think about that and think about how how we are going to communicate publicly um, as we go through this um, this process, uh, and I, you know, um, I don't know if we are, um, you know, I don't know. Well, I don't know a lot of the details where Albemarle County students might fit into this model, or if if they're not gonna fit into this model. And we, we probably don't have the answers to the, that question yet. Um, another you know, concerned party I think is that there is a KTEC foundation board. And I don't know if they have been brought into this process. If are people talking to them, um, they exist to support KTEC. And I think that they are, you know, it would be really important to make sure that they're um, involved in some way as we as we go forward. So I just want to make sure just um, I did have an opportunity to meet with the KTEC staff today. Um, and so I did um, want to reassure them and um, am reassuring them again in this moment that um, the, we plan for KTEC to remain the same. The only, I told them this morning that the only difference is that we may be making a recommendation to the school board that the A becomes area instead of uh, Albemarle. Um, but we recognize that KTEC is a beacon for the community and we would love to preserve that name. And I think that that's a great way to capture it. Um, also, we know that Albemarle students, as well as Charlottesville students, are uh, planning their schedule for next year. And so we want them to commit to the programs because we've committed to the programs and to Al ensuring that Albemarle students um, can access the programs. So uh, as we continue to move forward with programming, uh, we have standing meetings. I have a standing meeting with Dr. Haas and uh, Stephanie Carter every month. Um, and we want to make sure that um, as a part of this, that we are continue to communicate to Charlottesville families, as well as um, Albemarle families. We even have a few Bluvanna families uh, that they can still access the programming there. That was one of the questions from our, um, from the KTEC staff members. Um, what about the Albemarle students? And we will continue to serve the greater Charlottesville area. Um, and so um, I just don't want anyone to have any worries about that. Our vision includes the children, not just of Charlottesville City Schools, but of our greater region as well. And regarding the center board, if I may, just to answer all the questions, um, 
we're, we're all pretty clear in the core team that there's no reason that that can't continue on supporting those programs for the area, the KTEC Center Board. There, there's no reason do you, do to you disrupt. Do you mean the KTEC Foundation? Foundation Board. I meant to okay. say that. That's right. Yes. I'm confusing. It's it, the, the equivalent the foundation. of the PTA. It's equivalent of a PTA. Um, so we will still have the KTEC Foundation Board um, to continue to serve our students. The, the, the programs, to be there to support the programs. Yep. Again, as KTEC continues on, there's no reason for the foundation and its support for those programs not to be the same. Ms. Ms. Torres. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say thank you for the update. I mean, I think this is, like you said, the first step in, in many um, efforts to update not only this board, but the community um, at large as far as what's going on. And we definitely, um, prioritize that. Just as an FYI too, the, the joint board has not met since this decision was made. So, you know, the, the opportunity to have that conversation with, with everybody um, at the table, I think, you know, remains to be seen. Um, and just the timing, the scheduling of, of the calendar, we don't meet every month. Um, so, you know, that's an opportunity again to, to put some of those things out there. And I think we, you know, those of us who are on that board can make recommendations or, you know, we can talk about how we share some of this information out from the KTEC perspective and, and also with Albemarle. But I think um, we will definitely do that. So thank you. And yes, please let us know if you need help. And uh, one thing we didn't mention, we did meet with the city today. And so um, I will be presenting um, to the city council on April the 17th, um, just so that um, all stakeholders and our employer, um, our employers in the community just can continue to hear our vision for KTEC, which encompasses us continuing, KTEC continuing to be a pipeline uh, for the workforce. Ms. Moore. Thank you for the update. And um, also thank you, Dr. Gurley, for the, that answered a lot of my questions. Um, I just wanted to add that, like I think every student I've talked to at CHS um, is deeply appreciative of the board's decision to retain um, interest in KTEC. And uh, so I just wanted to reiterate. Thank you, Ms. Powell, for that update. The next item on the agenda, um, the school board committee reports have been du re duly noted and recorded. So now this is another opportunity to have comments from the community. So if you would like to come forward to make remarks, please state your name and your address. And I'll start with um, you or in the audience here. Do we have anyone who would like to come forward to speak? Please come forward and state your name and address. It's Chuck Moran, and I am a resident and native of Charlottesville. I live in the, Char in the Cherry Hill community right next to Johnson School, and I enjoy walking my dog on the Johnson School property. But I'm here today to talk about a couple of unfortunate things that I think have led to the conclusion and the renaming. And I want to say right up at the, the beginning of my remarks that I fully appreciate how fraught these kinds of decisions are. And I do appreciate the attentiveness that members of the board have given me, as well as the naming committee, have given me as I expressed my concerns, both individually and collectively through emails and even a video, as you recall, that I, I sent in to uh, express my concerns. They basically boil down to two things. One is that I feel like the sample size and the duration of this fact that the sample was, that the survey was open for such a short period of time is very unfortunate. And I think it having, had we looked at other communities, we would have seen that this was a year long process to uh, forge new names for, for schools. I also don't 
rabidly object to the concept of renaming schools for precisely your name, your, your, your position of having to explain things to, to young children. I do think though, Dr. Kraft's point about disparagement unfortunately did happen in this particular case, especially around my great aunt's name, namesake. Sarepta Moran, I'm probably the only person in this room and maybe the only person in this community who actually remembers her. I, uh, she actually was more of a grandmother to me than my own grandmother. And um, I find that as we begin this embarking on Women's History Month, that we are now in an unfortunate recognition of the fact that Mr. Varner, who did put forward some really good historical facts about Ms. Sarepta Moran and Ms. Carrie Burnley, unfortunately disparaged her through guilt by association. And if you read his remarks carefully, you'll see that he begins with a very factual statement that she was a member of the United Daughters of the Confederacy and the DAR, she was. If he had stopped there, we'd be fine. I wouldn't have a thing to say. The problem is he switches to what the UDC was all about and some of the activities of the UDC and by inference, drags her name into those things. He talks about historical activism. He talks about her perch and her ability to um, uh, have, have concerns and, and control over textbooks and those kinds of things. We have no proof of that, none whatsoever. So that, dis that is disparagement. I am a local, as I mentioned, I have two businesses here. Moran is my name. And so I see my time is up, but I would just like to close with a simple request that if we ever do this again, that we do it much simpler and that we look at it from a viewpoint of being a very clean process. And my last request is that if we really are truly going to erase the name of my great aunt from Burnley Moran, that her portrait and any memorabilia be returned to the family. And I think I speak for the Burnley family as well. Thank you very much for your time, I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Do we have anyone else who'd like to come forth? State your name and address. Um, Becca Saxon and I am, uh, my address is, my office address is One Morton Drive. Um, so as a parent of a uh, senior in Charlottesville High School, I just wanna thank you so much for the historic uh, vote you just took on collective bargaining. Uh, many of you have heard stories of my child over the years and he is not, um, imagine that he's a bit stubborn and a bit difficult and sometimes hard to reach. And I don't know where he got it, clearly not from me. It must've come from his other mother because um, it's not me who's the difficult one. Um, <laughs> but his success in, the, in him being, have gotten to where he is, is because of the hard work that his teachers have poured into him over the years. And the flexibility that they have been allowed to do what they need to do to reach him. And I am so thankful that we are now giving those educators the opportunity to be truly involved in making the decisions about what this school system needs for kids, because they are the experts. They are the people who uh, know what needs to happen and are able to get that done. And I am so appreciative that after all of these years um, of me recognizing what they have done and, and their ability to make those decisions, that you all have now taken that step to uh, do the same and to codify that and to make sure that that continues in perpetuity. Um, so thank you so much. Um, this is a wonderful night for the city of Charlottesville. Um, and my son, when I asked him if he was gonna come tonight, he said, well, I don't know that I want all the teachers to be able to make decisions, <laughs> but most of them deserve it. So, um, <laughs> but uh, so thank you, this has been, um, a wonderful process to go through, and it's exciting to see us get to this point. Okay, thank you for your comments, Ms. Axe. Is there anyone else in the room? Sure, why not? Um, you guys did a great thing tonight. Um, 
Uh, you should be proud of yourselves. And I, uh, I wanna thank Ms. McKeever. I've spoken at a few of these meetings. That's the first time anyone's ever responded to anything that I said, thank you. Um, I just wanna to respond to a couple of things um, that you said, the quote from the, the Concord Teachers Association president about being fired up. It's not about people being angry at each other. It's about teachers being excited and energized and, and wanting to participate. Um, and then as far as um, what I said about um, information sharing, you, I agree with you 100% that that is on us, um, that that wasn't directed towards the board. Um, that, that is our responsibility to share information um, with, the, with the teachers um, in Charlottesville. Um, Mr. Morse, I really appreciate your comment too about this being an opportunity to make things better for students and raise students' voices. A friend of mine who's a teacher here at CHS um, recently sent me a platform from the Portland Teachers Union um, that they put together for their bargaining. And they did so after having multiple meetings with community members and with students and finding out what, they, what their priorities were. Um, and that's what they brought to the bargaining table. And I, I hope that we have the capacity to do that here in Charlottesville um, to find out what our students want. Uh, and that's what we should be negotiating for. Um, and then last but not least, Ms. Bryson Morsberger, you mentioned, you know, this, this process won't necessarily be easy. We probably won't be. There'll be some difficult conversations um, and some disagreements. Um, and I would just return to my point that let's have those in the open. Let's do it publicly. Let's put our cards on the table. We have nothing to hide. We're public servants. Uh, let's let the public see what we have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Gordon. Next. Please state your name and address. Um, hello, my name is Dr. Emily Yen. I live at 506 Ridge Street in Char the city of Charlottesville. Um, and I just wanted to express my um, appreciation for um, you all passing um, this resolution. Um, I know that it took a lot of time and effort to try to get out all the details. Um, and I'm very excited for what can come out of this. Um, I'm very um, ex um, excited for um, the ability to find some win-win uh, solutions um, since um, there are many win-win solutions that can come out of this process. So I just wanted to thank you. Thank you so much. Do we have anyone else that would like to speak? <laughs> um, hi, I'm Jen Horn. Thank you so much. Oh, my work address is 1400 Melbourne Avenue um, right here. And uh, thank you so much, board members, Dr. Gurley. I'm back. <laughs> um, let's see, and, and it's still the same thing. I would like to open with the fact that I, I think we could all agree that virtual school was a nightmare. And coming back, we all were really hopeful that this place full of human interaction and curiosity and classroom discourse would become magical. And everyone, teachers, students, parents, would finally see the value of this. And, and it, it hasn't been magical and it hasn't been that easy. And I realize that the pie of issues is, is large and with many pieces. Um, my colleague, David Wilkerson, just recently wrote a great article that you should check out about our post-COVID experience. There are outside factors, there's mental health issues like my student Allison talked about, um, learning loss, um, too many classes that are still online <laughs> too often. There's a lot going on, but there's one piece of that pie that nurtures and exacerbates all of the others, and that is cell phones. And, and I am, I'm not joking. Um, they're pervasive, they're addictive, they're ubiquitously, universally a problem with every student of every different demographic that we teach. I'm gonna make a metaphor. Um, when I was in school, a freshman in high school, this will place me in age, we had a smoking court. Yes, we did. And by the time I was a senior in high school, school they got rid of the smoking court. Because as I said, at that time, Adults were still able to smoke on planes and in bars. Can you believe it? Oh my goodness, it was so disgusting. Um, but they decided that this thing that was unhealthy 
we were gonna protect our children. If we were gonna protect anybody, we were gonna protect our children. Um, I mean, grizzly bears protect their children. Foxes protect their children. We need to protect our children. We should not have cell phones in our school. Um, I have been doing some back and forth with Hopewell schools. Um, the Washington district in Pennsylvania have gone completely cell phone free, doing yonder pouches or lockers. I would love to, thank you so much, Ms. Dooley for reaching out. I would love to talk with you about advancing this. I know it's hard. I'm not gonna give my home address because people are gonna come and egg me. <laughs> um, I know it's hard, but it's really important. And I'll be back next month. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you so much, Ms. Horn. Is there anyone else who'd like to come forward? Mr. Como, do we have anyone in the Zoom room? Okay, well, thank you all so much for sharing your thoughts. Now we will have comments from the board and I will start with Ms. Wong. I mean, I'd just like to respond to uh, Ms. Horn. Uh, I mean, recently in, in talking with in students at CHS, that was one of the things that it's, it's, all, it's all connected for me, like phones, the like uh, filming fights and you know sharing that online and and also with with the topic of um, you know mental health it's it's I think just in at the start of the year there's a lot of there's a lot there's a focus on in classrooms on eliminating cell phones um, and I think. If, if that becomes um, policy for next year, I think it would be great to give um, students and parents much, a bit, much greater period of notice before implementing that because it was, it was very sudden and then, and parents are not used to having to go through the school and through the office, contact their kids and, um, and students connecting in, have to figure out how to connect in other ways. And so if there's can be a better transition period, I think that would be great and preferred by many students. Ms. Torres, any comments? Ms. Kraft? <clears throat> Dr. Kraft. <laughs> <laughs> I can't get away from that, can I? <laughs> I'll always be Dr. Kraft. Um, yeah, I'd like to thank the, the people who uh, came up to speak. And um, you know, I'd like to thank Mr. Moran for, for you for um, you know, continuing to share your, um, you know, your family name, your family story, and your, um, you know, your, your concerns and your points about our process. So I really appreciate that. And um, I'd like to thank my neighbor, Allison Duggar, um, for coming up and speaking. Um, and, and then also, you know, and, and Jen Horn, I think I, I um, you know, I'm a clinical psychologist and I, you know, I've really been, um, you know, thinking a lot and reading a lot about, um, you know, what has happened with our kids since COVID, you know, from the pandemic to now. And I think we're only beginning to realize the, um, you know, I say, I say the damage, but just the, um, you know, the impact on mental health um, that that had. And there, it's many, many layered, I think. And um, it made so much sense when students were isolated the way that they were, that they would turn to, um, social media or online, you know, any way to access contact with other people. Um, it, made, it made all the sense in the world, you know, to deal with the loneliness of the pandemic. Um, but I think there have been a lot of other consequences of that. And I think we're, we're really at a tipping point with, um, you know, the, the mental health con consequences in particular. Um, and so I think we do need to really think 
deeply and think hard about how to change the culture within the school um, in a way that, uh, you know, we, we being, you know, the adults, the professionals, um, you know, things that we know are harming our kids that we, you know, we do need to um, address them and do something about them. Um, and so I hope we can continue to have conversations, um, you know, ideas. Uh, I guess Ms. Duggar was talking about having monthly forums of some sort, you know, or converse, you know, opportunities for students to come and speak or for us to go into the schools and, and listen um, and to, to really make some hard decisions uh, that will support our students and, and their ability to, you know, be there as students to learn and to flourish and to interact with each other um, in person, face to face. So um, again, thanks to everybody who are bringing us some of these issues and concerns. We're, we're listening. Ms. Mossenberg. Uh, just a few comments. Um, first, I just wanna start off to say to Mr. Moran, I, if my comments came across as disparaging, that was not my intent at all. So if it came off that way, I do apologize. Um, and then, just, you know, in hindsight, this meeting, all the conversations that we have are hard conversations. Um, and so I just appreciate everybody coming to the table and having them, whether we agree or disagree. Um, and then for um, Ms. Horn, I, I, I agree with you. I think that cell phones are, they are addictive. There's so much on them um, to take up your attention and time. Um, so yeah, it's definitely something that we should look into. Um, I just joined social media as an adult um, so I could get to know people for um, campaign for office. And at a certain point, I had to just end all the accounts because I, as an adult, I was like, I'm overwhelmed with knowing what everybody thinks about everything all the time. And it just, I was like, I don't think like we're meant to know what everyone, I just don't think your brain can handle that many things. So I agree with you. We should look into that. So I appreciate you coming and making those comments. And um, for more student engagement, I look forward to us finding ways to engage students more. I like hearing from students. They have amazing ideas. They always give you the scoop of what's going on, the firsthand account. And um, so, yeah, I would like to get their voices more. My student at home, she took the survey about the schedule and she was just like, I can take the survey. I want the whole week off for Thanksgiving. This is awesome. <laughs> and so, you know, and I invite her to come to the school board meetings. I'm like, you can come. And she was like, I can speak. And I'm like, anyone can speak at the school board meeting. So finding a way to let students know that we'd like to hear their voices and making it more convenient for them to speak would be a great way for us to, to start to move forward. So thank everybody for coming. Ms. Morris, Ms. Julie. All right, um, I wanna thank uh, the teachers and staff who have attended these meetings and stick around until the end. It's only, I can't read that far, 640. So it's actually a relatively short night. I might make it home to say goodnight to my child, which is great. So I'll talk quickly. Um, we've had some pretty high attendance at these meetings as we've worked towards passing a collective bargaining resolution. Um, and I hope that attendance doesn't drop off. This is really just the beginning of a collaborative relationship. Um, and so um, please keep coming. Uh, whether it's two meetings. I know that not everyone can make these. I've seen several of the faces at this meeting at other meetings this week in the community. Um, I was really um, overwhelmed, I guess, by the showing um, from the school system at Monday's meeting um, at Dairy Market. Um, so thank you for being committed uh, to our community. Um, and I just hope that what we have done tonight with passing collective bargaining um, can offer a really productive partnership uh, between the schools, um, teachers and staff, uh, the superintendent and the board. Ms. McKeever. Uh, so I would just like to actually do something about the cell phone situation. Um, can we start a committee of people to look into and investigate how we can transition away from cell phones in the classroom? I just love 
hearing Miss Horn every month. Don't get me wrong. Um, <laughs> but honestly, I'm really, uh, I just, I feel like we need to do something about that. And it's exhausting to um, have to have her come after a long day of working every month to say the same thing. So um, I would just propose that we as a school board and or I'm not trying to pass a motion, but I definitely would like some between now and our next meeting in April to have some leadership around cell phones in our school division with our students and our staff. And I think fundamentally the most important question for me as a parent is what am I gonna, my child texts me every time there's an emergency, can you please come and pick me up? That is, he's had to do that multiple times this year. And the anxiety that the students feel is very real. And I just, you know, as a parent, I cannot have my child feeling that anxiety um, or I don't want him to, obviously he can feel anything he wants, but it is very important to me that he be able to access the comforting place and safe place for him. So as a parent and as a student, I, you know, I just think this fun, that's the fundamental challenge. Um, maybe we need, just need to put phones in our classrooms again <laughs> and start memorizing numbers, but we need some leadership around these cell phones. And I just, if we can't make this, I, I don't think Ms. Horn needs to go around talking to each one of us individually to make this happen. I think we've heard a consensus of more than a majority who are willing to look at further and time is ticking um, because, you know, August is gonna be in a minute. So I'd just like to see some action around that. Oops. Thank you board members for your comments. And certainly um, I'd like to thank everyone who came forward tonight to speak and it is a great day for teachers um, as far as collecting bargaining is concerned. And uh, Ms. Horn, I, where are you, Ms. Horn? Yes, um, I can empathize with you <laughs> as a former counselor. You know, I had some of the same issues with cell phones. Um, they thought the cell phone was probably more important than what I had to say in terms of guiding them um, through this maze called high school. So certainly um, Ms. Wakiva has a great idea of maybe having a committee to look to study this issue, um, not only teachers, but also students as well. Um, so I, I certainly concur with you on this. It's very critical. And I remember last month you said we can't compete um, with the cell phones. And that is so right. So it, it may need, it definitely needs to be addressed. All right, so Dr. Gurley. I wanna first thank, uh, First, I wanna say um, I feel so fortunate to have been a part of the collective bargaining um, process. I felt like as an instructional leader and as your superintendent that I, um, that I grew um, so much through the process. I got to um, learn um, from you all um, as a teacher unit. And so I'm very appreciative of the growth that I've made and, and just all of the professional development and, re and reading. Um, Ms. Duggar, I appreciate the student voice. Um, I, I think that that's what we just long for more of the student voice. And so absolutely using the black nighttime. I know we have, uh, I don't have the date and I probably should have um, looked on my calendar. We do have some black nighttime where um, Denise Johnson has set up where we will do the superintendent's advisory and, and continue to get more student input. Um, I want to say that um, I accept the challenge from Ms. Ms. McKeever. Um, I think historic, the historical um, perspective is that Ms. Horn put a lot of work and, and also um, Mr. Manning put um, Jocelyn, Jocelyn, Mr. Jocelyn put a lot of work into the cell phone, um, this cell phone policy last summer. And, and so this is not the first go, go around. And so just so some of the notes that I, um, that I had just jotted while we were sitting here, we, had, we have inconsistent implementation um, and that's about holding each other accountable. Um, so, you know, part of that is administrators holding teachers accountable, but it's also teachers holding, kind of like what Mr. Um, Koning said today, you know, teachers communicating with teachers and teachers holding teachers accountable. So what we know through this implementation 
they had a very thoughtful, like no phone zone. This is when phones can be used. So it was a nice compromise. Uh, and so we know that there was some missteps in the fidelity of implementation this school year. So we have some lessons learned. So that's why I said we can accept the challenge. I can accept the challenge because we know what some of the, 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 the challenges have been. Teachers um, and staff members not implementing it, but then there's the consistency and the follow-up on the administrative staff. So we all have a part, um, we all have a part in this. We also know that um, disproportionately, we've had um, certain pockets of students who, you know, who feel like I don't have many prized possessions in life. And this is the only thing that I own and it becomes this power struggle. Um, and teachers have said, I'm not getting into the struggle with students about taking cell phones away. So I, I think it's back to that whole mental health and systemic issue about like, what does the cell phone symbolize? Like, why is this so important? Um, and so I am, I, I'm definitely team no cell phone. Um, I, I can stand behind it, um, but we all have to stand behind it because as soon as we get one phone call, we, we all have to say cell phones aren't, allowed in the school. Um, so we have to take a position as a teacher group, as a, an administrative group, as the superintendent, as the school board. Um, and there's like very little room, room to waffle and waver here. And I think that that's what we've experienced through our implementation at the high school. Um, and then lastly, but most importantly, students have to lead the charge with the cell phones leaving the building. Um, this, this solely is about students. Um, if the students don't own this, because we live in a world now where our students are making the recommendation to parents what happens on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and so our students are going to have to take ownership. They're going to have to take ownership of this, creating this policy, implementing this policy, holding their peers accountable for this um, because I don't want Miss, I, Miss Horn would like to be developing lessons and doing all this. She doesn't want, she doesn't want to be here just for cell phones. Um, and so I just think that we have a lot of opportunities here, but our students have to own this um, because the power struggle, teachers shouldn't have to do that. Um, they should not have to be placed in the position where, um, telling students the phone shouldn't be here, should be put away, and, and we shouldn't have to resort to out of school suspensions for cell phones because it's just, we're just creating this other problem. So um, I accept the challenge. I just don't know if you're gonna have the answer you want by next month, but we, we can definitely, we can definitely, we've been, I mean, we had admin, an administrator, um, teachers. I mean, we had a big stakeholder group for this last school year. We got to get our parents behind us. We got to get our community behind us. Um, this is not just a, it's not a one and done. But the great work has already been started. And I appreciate, I'm appreciative of what's here, but there has to be some fidelity of implementation. And I love you all. And that's it for me. <laughs> all right. Thank you, Dr. Gurley. Well, Ms. Carolyn Swift, we'll come with a, you have nothing? Okay. All right. Well, a um, couple of announcements. We do have uh, March 18th, the school board will have their quarterly advanced school board meeting at Walker Up Elementary School at 8 a.m. March 18th. And our next school board meeting will be on April 13th here in the Media Center at 5 p.m. So if there's no further business, this meeting stands adjourned.